Great. Uh, well, welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us here today. We are part of the Horacea <laughs> Conference on Spearheading American Economic Growth, and I'm very pleased to uh, have me join, join here today with the Uh, the executive vice president of the Cato Institute, where he's been a leader of that institute on libertarian causes for, for many years. And Mike Shero, uh, uh, CEO of the C12 Group, which is a network of business leaders focused on living out biblical principles to their fullest. Uh, and um, uh, David Batstone, uh, the head of Just Business, which is a private equity mission-based organization uh, to invest in uh, businesses that uh, can live up to uh, great potential in the world. So thank you all for, for joining here today. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and dive right into an introductory question on, in terms of um, uh, the big trends that we're seeing. I think one of the, the things that we're seeing coming out of the pandemic is there has been a lot of economic disruption in the world. And so what I wanted to do is to kind of do a quick question first on setting what was happening up before the pandemic. What was what was the biggest economic trend you saw happening right before the pandemic? Oh, and Kim Folson has joined us. Wonderful. Kim, thanks for joining us here today. Uh, Kim is uh, involved in a, a startup investment and accelerator program for uh, entrepreneurs. Um, uh, now, she's got a network of them all over the country. So very glad to have Kim on board as well. Um, well good, so good what was the biggest afternoon. economic trend? Yeah, thanks for joining us. Uh, what was the biggest economic trend you saw happening before the pandemic? Um, I would, we'll just go around. Uh, uh, I'd love to hear your quick thoughts. Uh, Henry, what do you say? Sure. So it's not a trend that you can see on an X or Y axis, but I, I think even up uh, until the pandemic, there was just this underlying tension um, about income inequality, about uh, a different in, a different levels of wealth between generations, and you've seen the pandemic accentuate that, but also maybe bring us to a solution. So that was sort of a uh, a cultural or emotional trend uh, we saw that was laid bare eventually by the pandemic itself. Yeah, that inequality, I think, has been uh, something that was was really much, much in the news, and it feels like that's been exacerbated quite a bit. Uh, Mike, um, what do you say? Uh, what was the biggest economic trend right before the pandemic? I, I think that the strain on uh, workforce and talent development, whether it was access to talent, whether it was emerging gig economy factors and education models, but really just the overall strain of how how do we develop and give access to the workforce that would, would be part of a, a prospering economy. Mm -hmm. Uh, workforce in terms of shifts in like what types of skills are needed in the new economy? Yes, shifts of skill type, shifts in access. Um, they're kind of being held hostage to certain geographic zones. You know, those are certainly maybe some positive disruptions we're seeing, but the uh, the access to critical skill types, even, even things like uh, strains of immigration, limiting access to global talent to fuel the right kind of uh, industry growth. Great, thanks. Uh, David Boaz, um, your thoughts on the biggest economic trend happening before the pandemic hit? Well, I think the most interesting and surprising thing that was happening before the pandemic was that unemployment rates had come down farther than we thought they could for the economy as a whole and for every demographic group. And Obviously, the, the pandemic disrupted that, and it's possible it was being juiced by the Federal Reserve anyway. But I was, I, I was quite surprised at how low unemployment had gotten by the end of 2019, the uh, beginning of 2020. Hmm. There was that sense that uh, when you have low unemployment, you're supposed to have all these other problems, but we weren't necessarily seeing that, right? You're supposed to see higher inflation. You're supposed to see all these other market force constraints, but it, was, it did feel different uh, somehow. Something was different this time. Uh, David Batstone, um, your thoughts. Uh, biggest economic trend before the pandemic. Well, I began to see the, the marshalling of resources for how to address climate change. And that had to do with energy and transport, um, carbon emissions. Um, and, you know, that, of course, has accelerated to a great deal now around the world, but it was gearing up. And I think uh, with the new administration in Washington, we're seeing more of an economic commitment to that. Hmm. Great. Um, and uh, Kim, um, your thoughts, the biggest economic trend uh, leading up uh, to the uh, pandemic? Um, so I think that um, there were specific regions that were really uh, uh, 
competitively uh, positioned, be it the, you know, the Bay Area or New York, when you compare resources compared to the other areas in the community, <clears throat> you know, most of all the economic advancement was happening out of those regions and with everybody working remotely and you can work remotely from anywhere that really changed the landscape quite a bit. Mm. We, and we saw data like that around even like entrepreneurial activity that a few decades ago, entrepreneurial activity was widely spread across dozens of cities in the US. And now it's concentrated, a vast majority of it's concentrated into a handful of major cities and major metro areas in particular in the mm. US. Uh, Kim, I want to ask you a follow up then. What do you think the pandemic has shifted in terms of economic trend lines? Is it is that the big shift or do you think there's going to be other shifts that you see that have come out of this this past year? Um, so on the one, it's been the awareness of the gaps in equ equity, much more so than there have been before. Um, you know, I think that one, the pandemic and the um, how it's impacting various demographic groups much more so than others. Um, that's one. And, uh, and, and it's vastly, uh, changed how resources are being considered. Um, you know, there's been a tie between health disparities as well as economic disparities. Those are more coming to light, uh, much more so because you can see that as far as the pandemic's impact is more so to folks of color, underrepresented, under resourced communities than others. <clears throat> and uh, and so as a result, and and when you look at the uh, new kind of stimulus programs, as to how they are being taken advantage of by certain groups and not being taken not being able to take advantage by other groups, so that's becoming much more um, prevalent and transparent. I think that that issue of the people that were struggling before are the ones that got hurt the hardest in the pandemic, and the folks that were already <laughs> in a position to be you know, uh, you know, more fortunate or privileged before actually ended up doing even better right out of mm -hmm. that. And right. I think that that we're going to be uh, seeing more and more of that play out. Uh, Mike, your thoughts on that? What what did the pandemic do? You talked about uh, preparedness for the workforce. Do you think the pandemic has shifted that? Yeah, to, to follow up on what was just being said, I think we actually just had uh, arguably a generational setback for um, economic equity by the educational harm, particularly to young people, where the rate of school failures, which is going to affect workforce development, employability, college entrance, all those things just got a major setback, particularly for um, vulnerable communities around the country. So I think that's going to be a 20 year burden to tackle. I do think that the workforce has kind of got liberated. So uh, now you can access talent really anywhere. So it kind of leveled the playing field of talent access to employers and, and open up new possibilities both for entrepreneurialism as well as just how you source and deal with talent and it, it also opened up access outside of urban cores and really changed the landscape potential there um, i think in the same way that 9 11 gave us the tsa and gave us a uh, forever changed homeland security this is going to change the way we think about public health care and that's going to affect everything from real estate transportation and and uh leisure events. I mean, that, that's almost incalculable. But I do think the workforce being liberated to uh, a different landscape is going to change the way you uh, see productivity and new business opportunities emerge. Now, the workforce uh, liberated, you know, with new technologies and all that, but it still does require people who have access to these, these tools, right? And so you still need right. broadband, you need good technical equipment to be able to access that. It, right? It's going to strain you know, our, our power grid, our supply chain, our access to to, to uh, and with all those things, you're going to be massive burdens we get to solve in the near term to really capitalize the, the net productivity gains. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear uh, Henry Beck's thoughts on this. Henry, um, you know, you do, you're in a public position as the treasurer of the state of Maine, and okay. so you have to think about broad-based opportunity and the things that Kim and Mike are talking about are around inequities that are emerging in terms of the pandemic exacerbating some of these problems. What are your thoughts on that? What has the pandemic done to some of these economic trends? Sure. So the parallel story to uh, the need for broadband and pe people being able to work from anywhere is really the the probably the permanent displacement for those people and jobs that require a high school diploma or or less. Um, the pandemic accelerated their displacement and the harm there. And you know, it really goes to Mike's earlier comments. I had a meeting today um, about of all things FAFSA applications in the state of Maine. And FAFSA applications across the country are down. Okay, explain what FAFSAs are for people that don't know what FAFSAs are. FAFSA is the uh, too complicated uh, uh, process for students in the United States to apply for any amount of, of federal student aid. So 
it could be anybody at any stage in their career, but typically it's a, a, a senior in high school applying in the fall to go off to a four-year college, a two-year community college. Everyone fills out that FAFSA. And so if those uh, applications are down, it means the aspirations of the emerging workforce are down, which is sort of the worst situation to have given what the pandemic did to those those um, lower skilled uh, job sectors. Mm. Um, in terms of, um, uh, you know, the shifts and uh, uh, David uh, Boaz, you were talking around um, sort of low unemployment uh, before, leading up to the pandemic. How do you think the pandemic has shifted things in terms of that issue? Well, obviously, there's a lot of unemployment right now. I do think that I'm optimistic about the economy coming back once we are mostly vaccinated, mostly able to get back to work um, in all the ways that we haven't been able to. Uh, my concern is that the economy won't come back in exactly the same way. That When we first said, let's lock down, the idea was, what did they say, two weeks to slow the curve? And then it was, well, maybe six weeks to slow the curve. Now it's been a year. And not every restaurant will come back. Not every manufacturer will come back. And so to me, the challenge is keep the economy open enough um, that entrepreneurs, whether it's the next Steve Jobs or the next Corner Diner, are able to start um, to start a new business. And that means to me flexibility, fewer barriers. You were just talking about an incredibly complex uh, application for process for student loans. There are incredibly complex application processes, permitting processes, and so on to refurbish a building, to open in a particular place, uh, to hire workers, new regulations on how you can hire workers or contract with gig workers. And every one of those regulations, number one, makes it difficult for businesses to open. And number two, benefits bigger businesses over smaller businesses. Because no matter how many regulatory compliance... Oh, it's like we just lost... Uh, uh, the smaller businesses may not be able to new businesses. That's great. We we lost you there for a split second there, uh, David. Uh, but I think I think we captured ninety five percent of what you were saying. So, um, <laughs> all right. Uh, I think this issue around uh, how entrepreneurs start, restart, and grow out of the pandemic is a really key one. I think um, if you look at the data, uh, uh, you see some of the power of uh, over a fifth of businesses actually had to actually fully shut down at some point. And then that was very unevenly distributed where black owned businesses, brown owned businesses actually got really badly hit. Uh, and then a lot of people started with uh, very little savings to begin with and then having to come back out of that. A lot of people's savings have been wiped out. Mm -hmm. So I think this issue of how do people have the resilience and the nimbleness and are we do we have public systems to actually make that easier is going to be a real question. Um, D David Batstone, uh, your thoughts around what the pandemic has done in terms of shifting uh, the economic trend lines. Well, I don't know if we can uh, say it's the, the, the a pandemic necessarily, but the timing is such that there's been a stunning uh, shift towards um, electric vehicles, towards uh, alternative forms of energy, towards the development of that. And of course, you know, the, 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 the catch word is green jobs. And this is part of the, you know, Jennifer Granholm, the new uh, Department of Energy head, who's looking at ways to create jobs. Well, I'm an investor. And we're investing in this kind of future. We're building a factory right now in Nevada. So it's not in California. It's not in New York. It's, you know, it's out in Nevada and, and in other parts of the United States. We're looking at Michigan where we're going to be investing in infrastructure. I think, you know, back to David Boaz's point about the coming back of jobs. Uh, you know, can we start gearing up new jobs? Can we start investing in infrastructure? And, of course, the U.S. Congress is going to be looking at this. What kind of infrastructure investments can we make, not just in transport and not just in energy, but across the board that would create jobs not only in the same places where people of high income are now, but can distribute those to places where people are hurting? Well, that does seem to be a trend. If I listen to what all of you are saying, there's kind of two key themes coming out of that. One is around uh more equitable distribution of opportunity of, you know, not just opportunity, but also results. Like how do you actually, whether it's geographical or racial or by any other segment, there does seem to be a sense broad based uh, that things haven't been really even for a lot of people. And that coming out of this, there's a chance to redistribute in different ways, redistribute the opportunities. The other is uh, the issue around nimbleness and resilience. Like how do we actually bake that into the system? So people feel like they have a chance to be able to adapt and adjust and the system maybe as it was before, didn't give people 
all of that. Um, so I want to kind of tap into one of these fault lines, I think, in our economic um, in economy that's you guys have already touched on this around wealth inequality. Um, where do you uh, where do you see that? How, how do we address that issue? Like if we if we proactively have to deal with um, uh, some of these challenges in terms of broader distribution of opportunity, uh, nimbleness and resilience, what can be done to tackle this issue of wealth inequality? Um, let's start with uh, Mike. So I think from a, a construct approach, I think we're seeing a real opportunity to want to push um, things like employee stock ownership plans and things that uh, fundamentally help encourage uh, wealth creation across the workforce and and really regardless of, of industry type and skill type, something that has factory workers just as much as high tech workers um, getting a chance to, to create sustained uh, economic security. And that, that also further brings a bit of more institutional accountability and and, uh, and kind of culture long-term mindedness. And so I think some pieces around that, especially in an era where there's no more pension plans generally, and uh, the risk of, of economic inequity being just kind of exacerbated, things like ESOPs and uh, trusts like that are going to be powerful. And I think further addressing rural access and making sure that everyone truly does have equal access to these new uh, digital type jobs and job creation uh, in, in all parts of the city um, are going to be key to helping having equal access to the table. So I, think I love that. That's, yeah, you're talking around like reinventing business forms, right? And even mm -hmm. structures of how you do business. And I think yeah. there is the sense that whatever the system has been in terms of the corporate forms we use or the business entities we use, that somehow that's created some imbalances and in inequities. Well, and, and I mean, you, uh, Victor, you do a lot of work in this space, but there's a lot of, of the hurdles for starting to create wealth in ventures where the, the hurdles, whether it's complexity of forms and paperwork, as our friend from Maine said, or whether it's licenses, permits, and fees, uh, almost favors the existing wealthy organizations, businesses, and individuals to be able to perpetuate that and raise the bars of access. So I think things that lower the bars of access that then creates natural free enterprise rewards uh, is, is a win-win for everybody. Yeah, I, I the analogy I, I like to talk about is uh, pebbles in a stream that, you know, people say uh, entrepreneurship rates have fallen in this country by about half over the last several decades. And a lot of people are shocked by that statistics. And people, then the next question is, well, how did that happen? And I like to say it's like pebbles in a stream Every pebble in a stream looks like it's pretty harmless, but once you have enough pebbles, you've started to dam the stream. And so you can actually look at lots of lots of reasons that have gone into those pebbles and each one ends up incrementally making it harder. And so we've actually created a system that doesn't make it easy to, to start. And um, uh, I wanna uh, ask Kim about this because I know Kim has been tackling this issue head on. She's been on the front lines of building out a new uh, startup investment group and accelerator for uh, entrepreneurs that might have been left out before, including developing new financial models for how you invest into new businesses. Um, can you talk about uh, that, Kim, about how do you think we can address some of these inequalities uh, in terms of people's access to entrepreneurial opportunity? Certainly. Um, well, uh, as an entrepreneur who's been at this for 30 years, it's definitely way more complicated than it was in the crazy dot-com era. Um, you know, I would say that while there has, uh, to your point, uh, Victor, there has been a decline for businesses, startups that are led by, you know, majority led businesses. But if you look at people of color, they're starting businesses at a much faster pace in the last five years, um, almost seven, per, you know, seven times the rate of, of others. But the challenge is that they don't happen to have the same startup resources. Um, and so they tend to be either side hustles or solopreneurs. Um, so, um, so you have that, that element, and then you add on to that, um, you know, access for growth. Um, so there are a few things that can be done. Um, you know, many of these companies are getting access to, you know, with the current situation, not only the unfortunate pandemic, but the, uh, the other, you know, elements that have happened around, uh, that have made the whole, um, racial social equity issues much more prevalent. Look at the, you know, Black Lives Matter movement, um, George Floyd and all of those particular things have caused many people to make um, more pledges to uh, help address those gaps. So that's one issue that's being addressed. And then the other, I would say, um, 
you know, these businesses have traditionally not had the same financial resources. You know, when you think about the PPP and EIDLs, where, you know, when you've had, um, you know, things that have been stoppages for companies have caused them to shut down. That's why, you know, 40 plus percent of them have shut down because of the pandemic. But all of that said, you know, is so horrible. There are some things that are happening that are turning some things around. One is, and Victor, you've taught, wrote about this quite a bit, is that the whole 5% to help grow these businesses. And that includes the, you know, um, willingness of government, uh, quasi-government, as well as public, uh, or public and private companies being willing to engage these businesses as solution providers and suppliers. Because these diverse founded companies have a 80 to 90% diverse workforce. When they grow from one to 10 employees, which, you know, 80% of our um, jobs are created by those businesses under 20 employees, when they get an opportunity to grow, they're growing a diverse workforce. And so that's one issue. The other thing that's happening by this pandemic is a great adoption of technology like never been before. I mean, 5G is being uh, adopted streaming, telehealth, and all of these things that were around even as, as early as the dot-com era, but they just were never adopted because it wasn't a requirement. And because of that adoption, that's providing more opportunity. And many of these companies are having to put those uh, technologies to work as part of their solutions to serve the market. Now, that uh, Kim, you talked about that uh, 5% to start. Uh, this is an initiative. I should explain just a little bit of context. I, so I've started a uh, nonprofit organization called Right to Start, which is focused on expanding entrepreneurial opportunity so everyone can get access to it. Uh, and one of the initiatives uh, we focused on is what we call 5% to start, which is taking uh, a lot of key government resources that currently go to large, older uh, corporations and shifting it towards entrepreneurs. And if you look at things that you would think actually are already at 5%, they're not. So like workforce development, if you look across, you know, how workforce spending is spent across the U.S., almost all of it is spent for large corporate job placement and industrial era skills. Uh, economic development, most vast, almost all of it is spent towards large company attraction and retention. And if you look at government contracts, almost all of those goes towards larger incumbent organizations that know how to work the system and have some record. So if you can just take 5% and just shift it over to the entrepreneurs, you can actually make a huge dent in uh, in helping boost up the entrepreneurs. Uh, but I'd, I'd like to ask uh, Henry this question because you're in a, in a public role and I know you've done a lot of work around financial innovation to try to reach people in uh, be able to you know access financial resources and help change the game for people in your state. Can you talk a bit about uh, how you can use, how public financial resources can be used uh, to uh, help overcome some of these in inequality issues. Well, sure. I mean, on income inequality generally, I mean, um, I think progressive taxation is key, but there's going to be a great hesitancy and understandable hesitancy to take any action on taxation right now because we're in the middle of a recovery. We talked about ESOPs. You know, I still believe that collective bargaining is terribly important uh, for for income inequality. And I mean, yes, access to capital for entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs for um, historically disadvantaged communities, especially from, from quasi agencies, that, that, is, that is terribly important. Um, it's also just as efficient, I think, for the government to continue the, the broad based cash supports that they were so willing to do um, during the pandemic, whether that's on an ongoing basis or if it's a broad initiative like student loan uh, debt forgiveness and, and that kind of thing. But income inequality, I just, I always believe it's, Progressive taxation, collective bargaining, and overall economic growth. But that would be multi pronged, both for entrepreneurs and also, you know, cash support. Mm -hmm. uh, Dave, David Batstone, you've been involved in uh, investing into uh, enterprises that can fulfill, uh, you know, these public mission driven uh, purposes. Uh, what do you think about a lot of these issues around, you know, I think some would argue that the financial sector has not always distributed, you know, finance capital to the, all the places that would fully need it. Um, how do you think the financial innovation can support some of the these wealth inequality issues? Yeah, it's a real challenge for um, entrepreneurs from disadvantaged communities to get access to capital. And, you know, you uh, it, just from my experience of being in Silicon Valley and having my own firm for the last 15 years is that so much of that capital is a it's a it's a network of people who went to Stanford or Harvard or you know, went to the same schools or they, they grew up in the same communities. And. So much of that capital raising takes place uh, through these informal networks that, of course, uh, uh, 
other communities who have not had the educational and economic advantages of being a part of them in America have been left out. So breaking that requires a more proactive approach than just letting the market do its work. So, um, you know, I, um, in my case, uh, you know, just business has a very double entendre. It's just business, but it's just business. And so we gather uh, family offices and investors who say, we want you to make a profit, but we equally want you to make a social or environmental change. We want to see supply chain, uh, access to education, access to new jobs, access. So can we marry profitable businesses with designing a future that we want our children and our country to grow into? And I think we have more entrepreneurs that need to make those commitments because if it's just going to be an um, open market, then it's going to reinforce traditional networks. I think that's really interesting what you're saying around um, that the, the the financial systems are unequal. It, this is work uh, when I was at the Kauffman Foundation and I ran the entrepreneurship department there, we published a study uh, and the study basically came up with the conclusion that um, 80, over 83 percent of entrepreneurs are not served by either the current venture capital markets or the banking markets. And so you end up with the vast majority of entrepreneurs. They could be all sorts of businesses. Uh, from your corner, corner store to your home-based business to your, you know, startup in a garage business that actually cannot get capital because the current markets don't support that. And so that's really interesting what you're saying around how the system hasn't taken care of itself in a broad sense. It hasn't made, uh, it's taken care of itself, I guess, but it hasn't made capital fully available to a lot of people. Is that right? Yeah. And Victor, we often talk about democratization of education. We talk about democratization of training. What we don't often talk about is the democratization, democratization of the access to capital, right? Not, uh, so we're not talking about feudal capital. We're talking about democratic access to capital. And that has to require another level of civic engagement. Mm. I, I, I love that way of putting it. I, I think of uh, this as, you know, a lot of the debate in the country and a lot of countries is around distribution of wealth. But what we really are not talking about is distribution of means to create wealth. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be this big hole in our civic discourse that uh, needs to be filled. I, uh, uh, David Boaz, I'd be interested in hearing this because you come out of a you've been one of the you know leaders in libertarian thought around this. And it seems like there's a, a, a lot of sentiment that perhaps the market hasn't taken care of itself fully yet. Uh, but there's things that need to be f tweaked or fixed in the market to actually make it more uh, broad based in terms of opportunity. How, how would you think about this issue? Well, I think there are a lot of bad government policies that ought to be tweaked. And that's what I spend my time on. If I'm looking at wealth inequality, um, the first thing I'm going to say is there are a lot of policies that create upward redistribution of wealth. Uh, tariffs and other interference with trade, occupational licensing, which protects certain uh, professionals from competition, agriculture subsidies, mostly going to bigger farms. All of those things, I would like to get rid of a lot of that and open up the economy more and stop pushing wealth upward. But as a long-term spreading the wealth idea, I would like to transform our social security system from you pay a tax for 40 years and then if you live long enough, they give you some money back that maybe has gained you 1% over the course of 40 years um, to a system where you take that money and you put it into, in effect, an IRA. And so instead of depending on the government to pay you money 40 years from now, you're building up actual wealth which you can then use in your own retirement, but also because you own the corpus, you don't just own the right to get the check, a monthly check, you can leave it to your kids. And we could discuss whether you should be able to tap that money uh, to send your kids to, to a better school or to start a business, things like that. But at the very least, if you were able to put that six and a half or so percent, or even 13%, if you include the employer, uh, of your of your income your whole life, every person who worked for 30 or 40 years um, would have what we would consider real wealth. Hmm. I, I think that what you're talking around on licensing and uh, and sort of the ability to um, uh, uh, job mobility or economic mobility is key. I think uh, some of the studies show that 20 to 30 percent of workers are held back by uh, license, some kind of licensing requirement in their jobs and 20 to 30% of workers are held back by non-compete agreements that keep them from leaving a job to go start a business to compete against their old industry. There just seem to be a lot of 
these types of structural impediments that keep people from adjusting um, to the economy. I'd, I'd love to dig into uh, another question around education. This has come up just a little bit, but we haven't really expanded on this issue. And uh, the frame I'd like to put on this is that I think our education system, we're still teach, largely teaching pe- kids the way we've been teaching them for decades, yet the economy is entirely different. The tools that kids use to learn and gather information are entirely different. Uh, they call this new generation of kids, uh, what was Gen Z are now called the Zoomers because they spend so much time on li- you know, learning in digital environments, whether that's by choice or not. Um, but then it feels like our education system really is still teaching a lot of industrial era test taking skills as opposed to more applied real world you know skills on problem solving so we're and i've i have young kids that are going through school now and it seems like so much of the education is still focused on you know trying to figure out the right answer to a problem as opposed to dealing with uh, questions or situations where there's no defined problem, right? Where you actually have to go into something where you actually don't know where to start. Um, I'd love to uh, sort of dig into this just because it's it's so related, but we haven't really talked about this around uh, what can be done to actually rethink education from a you know policy initiative or an education leadership position to kind of help help the future kids adapt to this economy. I'll start with Mike, because you've been talking about workforce quite a bit on this issue. So I know you, you, you brought up education earlier. But what can be done? Let me say a variety of things from, from like you said, are we are we preparing cattle to go into the, the jobs and the, um, the future markets of 30 years ago? Are we helping prepare young people to be successful in a, in a very dynamic marketplace? So from you know, practical skills on consumer finance and communication the ability to write and speak and actually be able to engage but really the the need to teach um, the ability to solve problems and to encourage whether yeah I think entrepreneurialism maybe gets overly narrowly defined as just being someone who goes and starts the next Facebook but the reality is that generations of me entering a world of rapid technology rapid geopolitical changes lots of disruption and we need to create young people who are who are encouraged and skilled at deciphering worlds and solving problems and not expect them to I feel like in some ways our education system is teaching kids you know, how to use a fax machine. And it's like, well, what, why? We need to teach them how to go into a, a marketplace where they can either create opportunities and uh, communicate and navigate with diverse people, diverse backgrounds, diverse issues, and have have agility. And that, that is very much a skill development. They, they need to know history. They need to know these, these classical subjects. But when we're teaching to test and assume that everyone passed this, go to college, you know, obtain a hundred thousand dollars in debt, and then figure out what you would be to grow up is is creating a, a financial slave caste of, of kids underprepared to be successful and then economically oppressed, unless they've got inherited economic wealth, they can liberate them from that to then figure it out. And so, I I think you that, I think there's, there's that sense that we've created a a you know a world of consumers that are very passive as opposed to active problem solvers, and that's very overgeneralized, of course, but. Just feel like that. I, I've, I often think about because I'm involved so much in entrepreneurship and trying to lift up that as a you know as a policy issue and priority. Is that you know we have more people, we have more power on these devices than any humans ever had. Like from the t- from the tips of your fingers, you can actually create, invent almost anything, uh, have it manufactured almost anywhere, and have it distributed and sold, and have revenue flow right back to you. Yet, who teaches that, and how do we actually? you know, teach kids to become makers and creators and builders as opposed to consumers. I feel like that's a really interesting moment. I'd love to um, tap uh, Kim, because I know you've been involved in, you know, helping helping people come up to speed on, you know, entrepreneurial skills and actually creating value. Um, how, how do we tackle this issue of education? You get them by the time they're adults, but even before then in education, how do we actually prime them to actually be able to adapt to this world better? Sure. Um so yes, with Founders First, we do uh, have our you know small business growth accelerator. But one of the programs we started uh, last year actually was beginning to introduce business leadership to fifth grade students in underserved communities. Because when you look at people that are starting entrepreneurial ventures, it's not the textbook experience that helps guide them to do that. It's the other tangible experience of conversations at the dinner table, at social um, uh, and, and family gatherings where they have an uncle or a cousin or a neighbor that's running a seven and eight figure business and they have those ideas and those representations planted. 
And that has not been traditional entrepreneurial, um, uh, you know, uh, opportunities have not been in many of those underserved communities. So problem solving skills that you talk about, that when you teach students about either uh, how to understand the stock market or entrepreneurship or those particular type of elements, that they learn those applied math skills and um, analytic skills and problem solving skills that are really great to help you in advance with advanced mathematics, science, and, and those types of things. And so we're beginning to introduce that, but that's really super critical. Um, you know, there have been select organizations like uh, Ariel Capital, for example, they started um, their um, Capital Academy in Chicago to teach, you know, students as early as kindergartners about, um, you know, the, you know, investing and all of those types of things. But, you know, you, ha you see that happen in that particular community, but it's not in someplace else. So really trying to, you know, given that we have a national footprint that every region we're in, we're going to touch a group of students related to that. But you have to start that exposure early to build that pipeline. I think that's really interesting. It's It really is kind of a... Uh a broader set of issues. Like if you're trying to, ref, you know, reform a curriculum for education, then you hit, then you hit at these issues of teacher training and certification, school certification, uh, mm -hmm. metrics and testing. And so it's kind of like a full 360 problem. It's not just where you can do one little tweak here or one little tweak there. Um, uh, Henry, you're in a public role where, you, you know, you, you're in the treasurer's office, but a lot of financing towards schooling. I, I assume this, that stuff's on your desk in terms of how to raise money for education and things like that. Um, how do you think about this issue in terms of the future of education and how the public sector can can support the, that that evolution? Well, I, I think there's now a consensus, right? I think everybody, liberal, conservative, Democrat, Republican, young, old, there, there's a consensus now uh, that we didn't always get it right uh, talking about higher education and that we have to focus more on STEM and focus more on, on problem solving. But my my great concern, I think what we're seeing play out, the great danger to all those conversations is that, um, you know, the next generation of students and their families, when they hear those conversations, they just hear that anything post-secondary is just not worth the investment. Uh, and there are the, these horror stories about debt uh, and, and, you know, mismatched uh, degrees. So that's number one. That's not a specific government policy, but it's just, it's just like, I think, a caution to the, in the national conversation. Well, we've been pushing kids to go to college at all costs, right, for decades now. And now we're seeing they have diplomas, but what are they good for um, if the jobs aren't there and the economy has shifted so rapidly? Uh, we've taught them to be critical thinkers, but they don't know how to create, you know, economic value or they're not always employable. Is that what you're talking about, Henry? Well, I'm talking about that conversation. I'm, I'm afraid what it's leading to is it's leading to uh, future workers with no credentials, with no credential of value. Uh, because there's so much pessimism about anything that's post-secondary. Or, of course, the worst thing you could do, right, the worst thing you could do is uh, halfway complete a, a post-secondary education and have debt and not, not complete it. Uh, that, that's, sort of, that's the worst thing. So I think we just have to have – we have to manage the conversation in, in a correct way. As far as, you know, uh, funding for education, I mean, yes, it is, it is just – it is a, a, a growing line item in every state, every county, every city – and for a state like Maine, we actually have fewer students than we ever have. So the, the, the per uh, student per capita cost is growing. And how we address that, um, I, we, we can't do it without a fundamental change to education infrastructure that might actually harm the value of the educational experience itself. So I think we have to accept it's going to be ex expensive and we have to have the conversation about uh, reform or the right skills in the right way. Mm. That's a that's a powerful discussion. Actually, David Batstone, this would be a great question for you, just because the cost of education keep going up. But technologically speaking, they should be going down. Right. We've got this really interesting <laughs> thing where, you know, you can go online like, you know, my kids and lots of kids. They can learn almost anything via YouTube and they can find tutors all over the world now. And you can you, there's there's platforms for all kinds of learning. Yet our educational systems are just get more and more expensive as time goes by. And you invest into new technologies and promising companies. Uh, 
what do you think about this? I mean, is there what needs to shift? As Henry was saying, there needs to be some some radical shift in the way education is done. Yeah, well, you know, I also speak as a tenured professor at the University of San Francisco. So I'm both on, you know, I'm on the technology side where I'm investing in new learning technologies, but I'm also uh, teaching in the classroom. And, you know, universities are in crisis. Um, and I do believe that in the next 10 to 15 years, we will not recognize the university in the same way as it is today. It's just the infrastructure and the facility costs, the sunk costs in um, making the operation run is not sustainable. So where does it go? Um, you know, we talked about online education. Well, probably the biggest nightmare for our kids and the kids I teach is that most professors or teachers have taken the same bankrupt pedagogy from what they've done in the classroom. Now they put it online. Now it's even more boring. It's not even more non-engaging. So how do we create, um, you know, how do we create situations where students see the relevance of what they're learning? The relevance for future jobs, the relevance for their life, the relevance for how they can expend their energies in the community. And uh, it comes back to what you said a little bit earlier, Victor, about problem solving. It's about, you know, real world things that engage or incorporate research, incorporates theory, but within the solving of problems. Hmm. I love that. Um, David Boaz, your, your thoughts on education and what we can do to, uh, you know, help direct students to the future of where the economy is going. I like to look at these things systematically. I'm looking for systemic reforms. And what I see is that in our lifetime, every form of information technology and transfer has changed radically, except the post office and the schools. And it seems clear to me that the reason for that is those are the two places where you're not getting markets and entrepreneurship and consumers involved. You've got sluggish state bureaucracies. No offense to anybody who's in a state bureaucracy, but it's not a system designed for rapid change and being ahead of the curve. And so I think we should transform education into a more market-oriented choice system. Let the As Henry was saying, we're spending a lot of money more per more per student all the time. Let the dollars follow the kid, not just go directly to the school. We say, here, the school has this money and you kids are assigned to go to this school. Let the dollars follow the kids and maybe they will find a private school or a religious school or a new entrepreneurial school or a Khan Academy or something we haven't thought of yet. David was talking about the universities are going to change radically. I hope that's true. But what I see is that nobody predicted the Internet. Nobody predicted what Steve Jobs would do. Nobody predicted what Facebook would turn into. So I don't know what the best way to deliver education is, but I'm pretty sure the answers would come better in a competitive system where families are choosing in their own interest than from bureaucracies. So I want a system of, of widespread choice. Innovate, opening up innovation, making it more both the innovation itself as well as the opportunity to benefit from the innovation. Uh, is, it seems to be a, a kind of a theme across all of this, which is how do you really democratize the means to innovate and to create value? Um, we got just a couple minutes here. Um, I'm going to ask for one word from each of you to close this out. Uh, in the old movie, The Graduate, um, uh, you know, the gentleman tells uh, Dustin Hoffman, like, what's, you know, what, one thing to invest in for the future? And he said, plastics, uh, son, you know, invest in plastics. Um, I'm going to ask you guys the same thing, but, you know, we're not in plastics anymore. Uh, or maybe we're talking about, you know, green plastics or something like that. But what's one word uh, that you'd like to give for, for advice for the future? Uh, we'll start with Kim. Inclusivity. Great. Um, Mike. Yeah, I would say uh, vision. Creating vision. Vision. Uh, Henry. Climate. Climate. Great. Uh, David Boaz. Flexibility. Flexibility. David Batstone. Hydrogen. Hydrogen. Awesome. Um, and I'm going to throw in my word as a participant, entrepreneurship. I feel like uh, giving people the individual means to create their own value and control their own lives is is the future. 
Uh, this has been a great conversation. I've enjoyed this a ton. Uh, I've gotten a lot of value from meeting with you, talking with all of you, and hopefully uh, the people that are watching uh, enjoyed this as well. Thank you all. This is such an important topic as we come out of the pandemic and look towards economic growth that's more widespread and uh, there's more opportunity around. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.